Hello, hello. The so-called Rule of 70, or the closely related Rule of 72, is just the kick in the pants you need to make you think seriously about growing a money tree so that you will be able to retire comfortably someday. The rule itself can be used by anyone who knows basic arithmetic. And understanding why the Rule of 70 works only requires a little more math, namely logarithms. And if you want to delve into every nook and cranny, it helps to know the Taylor series for the logarithm function too. But don't worry, even if you have never encountered logarithms in your life, you can still get a lot out of this video. In the next few minutes, I will explain what the Rule of 70 says, why it is important, and for those with the math to follow it, why the rule actually works. So, the Rule of 70 says that if your money grows by R% percent per year, and that R% percent could be an interest rate in a savings account or the return on an investment or whatever, then it takes about 70 divided by R years for your money to double. As you'll soon see, this is a powerful little rule of thumb. I should also note that 70 over R is very close to 72 over R, so we sometimes use 72 over R instead if it's more convenient. For example, it's easier to divide 72 by 9, which gives us 8, than it is to divide 70 by 9, which gives us, um, well, you see the point. So I'll note here that 72 over R works too, which is why you sometimes hear this rule called the rule of 72. Anyway, to appreciate what this is telling us, and why it is important, let's imagine two friends of the same age named Moses and Jesus, and let's imagine their lives mapped out on a timeline. Well, from the time they were young boys, they often talked to each other of the great things they planned to do in their lives, and they agreed that they'd like to retire sometime between the ages of 65 and, say, 73, depending on their health, wealth, and so forth. At the time our story begins, these two friends are 30 years old, and each of them decides to put away $20,000 towards their retirements. So what do they do with their money? Well, Jesus saves, so he goes to the bank and puts his money in a savings account, where it earns 2% interest per year, and he's not going to touch that money until he retires. The Rule of 70 tells us that the doubling time for his money will be about 70 over 2, so about 35 years. So in 35 years, when he's 65 years old and thinking about retiring, his 20,000 will have doubled to 40,000. Not bad, but while Jesus saves, Moses invests. 30-year-old Moses opens a brokerage account and puts his 20000 into the stock market, where it grows at 9% per year. Okay, 9% is bigger than 2%, so that seems good, but how much difference can it really make, you might ask? I mean, they're both one-digit numbers, so sure, maybe Moses will make a bit more money, but will it be significantly more? Yes, it will, and the Rule of 70 will show us why. According to the Rule of 70, but here using 72, which will be more convenient, the doubling time for Moses' investment will be 72 over 9, so 8 years. That means that when Moses is 38 years old, his 20,000 will have doubled to 40,000. Eight years later, when Moses is 46 years old, his 40,000 will have doubled to 80,000. Eight years after that, when he's 54, it will have doubled again to 160,000. Another eight years, another doubling. He's now 62, and his initial investment is now worth 320,000. And he may still have one more doubling period left before he retires. Eight years later, when he's 70, that money has doubled again to 640,000. So by the time these two men are approaching, or at, retirement age, the choices they made as to what to do with their money at the age of 30 have led to very significant differences in wealth. And of course, we've only followed one decision that they've made. Both men should be putting money away for retirement throughout their working lives. Let's say, for another example, that when they are 40 years old, Moses and Jesus each have another $10,000 to put towards retirement. Let's say that Jesus still wants to keep his money in the bank, but now instead of just sticking it in a savings account, he buys some CDs, certificates of deposit, at the bank, and these net him 4% growth, which is certainly better than 2. Well, the rule of 70, or let's do 72, tells us that his doubling time will be about 72 over 4, which is 18 years. So when Jesus is 58, his 10,000 will have doubled to 20,000. And 18 years after that, when he's 76, and thus well into retirement age, it will have doubled again to to $40,000. Again, not bad. But what about Moses? Well, Moses and some of his friends pool some money, including Moses' 10000 and invest in some real estate, where they do very well indeed, 12% growth per year. Of course, the rule tells us that his doubling time for this one will be about 72 over 12, which is a mere six years. This, of course, sets off a chain reaction of doublings, so that by the time Moses is 70, his initial outlay of 10,000 is now worth 320,000. So, once again, 
Moses has outperformed Jesus. Overall, by the time these two are around retirement age, Jesus has turned his $30,000 outlay into about $80,000, while Moses has turned his $30,000 into just under a million dollars. And of course, these were not the only two times they put money away for retirement. So maybe Jesus ends up with a few hundred thousand, while Moses has a few million. And as a consequence, Moses will be able to retire earlier, drive a much nicer car, and go on vacations while Jesus is still doing the odd carpentry job to stay ahead of his bills. Reflecting on this little parable might be enough to encourage anyone who doesn't already have a brokerage account to go open one, but if you are more mathematically minded, it should also make you think, hey, but why does the rule of 70 work? And that is the question we'll be considering for the rest of this video. So, suppose we have some initial amount of money, which we'll call A for amount. After one year of earning R percent, those A dollars will have turned into what? Well, we'll still have our initial A, but we'll also have something new to add to it, our earnings, namely R percent of A. But R percent of A just means R one hundredths of A, and you'll remember from basic algebra that we can rewrite that expression by factoring an A out of both terms, leaving us with A times the quantity 1 plus R over 100. Good. The key observation here is that whatever our initial amount was, to determine what we'll have one year later, we simply take that initial amount and multiply it by this expression in the orange box, 1 plus the growth rate over 100. But don't even think about the details of that expression for now. Just think of it as the magic orange box that takes us, algebraically, from one year to the next. For example, how much will we have after two years? Well, we just take what we have after one year and multiply it by the orange box. This gives us A times two copies of the orange box, or as we'd write more compactly, A times the orange box squared. And now you can surely see how this works. After three years, we have all the money we started with at the end of the second year times the orange box. Or more compactly, after three years, we have A times the orange box to the power of three. And on and on this goes. It should now be clear that after T years, for any value of T, we'll have A, our initial amount, times the orange box raised to the power of T. One box for each year. This is progress because we can use this expression to build an equation whose solution will be the doubling time that we are trying to prove really is about 70 over R. The idea is that if we let D be the number of years we need to double our money, then to get from A, our starting investment, to 2A, where our money has doubled, we'll need to multiply by the magic stuff in our orange box, D times. But what is D? Well, now that we've got it in an equation, we can solve for it. The first thing to observe is that we have a factor of A on both sides of the equation, so we can cancel those out. Now this has already revealed something interesting. There are no A's left in the equation. That means that the doubling time must be independent of A. It has nothing to do with our initial investment. It only depends on the rate of growth. Anyway, we're trying to solve for D, but it is perched up in a tree, as it were. How do we get it down? We'll use the tool we always use for solving exponential equations, logarithms. The key property is that if we start with anything and raise it to some power, then applying a logarithm to the whole thing has the effect of pulling the power down to the ground where it becomes a mere factor. So we can apply this tool to our equation by simply taking the logarithm of both sides. When we do that, the exponent d gets pulled down from its perch and simply becomes a factor of the left-hand side. To solve for d, we just need to divide both sides by the left-hand side's other factor. When we do that, we find that d is log 2 over log 1 plus r over 100. Good, now we have an exact expression for the doubling time. But nobody wants to carry that awful thing around in their heads, and even if you could remember it, actually using it on the fly to make quick calculations would be tedious. You would need to haul out a scientific calculator. But now that we have an exact, albeit unwieldy, expression, our next task will be to soften it up a bit, to trade a little accuracy for big gains in comprehensibility and user-friendliness. This is going to involve two approximations, one for the numerator and one for the denominator. Let's start upstairs where we have log 2. Now log 2 is just a number, a constant, and if we consult a calculator, we see that log 2 is about 0.69. So if we are willing to soften our equation into an approximation, we can trade that log 2 for the much more tangible 0.69. Good. Now let's put our calculator away and think about the denominator. This is much trickier because the denominator is not a constant, so we can't just get a numerical approximation for it. Instead, what we have downstairs is a function of r, and an unpleasant one at that, involving a logarithm. Well, how do we approximate a function? 
The trick is to replace the function with a simpler function whose output values approximate the output values of our original unwieldy function, at least for the sorts of inputs in which we're interested. But how do we find a simpler function that will do the trick? I'll show you such a function and explain how it works in two ways, and hopefully at least one will resonate with you. The first is a high-level approach. If you've had a year of calculus, you've probably met the idea of a Taylor series. Well, the Taylor series for log of 1 plus x is a pretty well-known one. If you don't know that one, but you do know about Taylor series in general, it should be easy for you to derive. I'll leave those details to you, but the series ultimately looks like this. The first term is x, and then there's the higher order stuff, which, if we are willing to change this equality for an approximation, can be thrown away, leaving us with the useful approximation log of 1 plus x is approximately x, at least when x is a fairly small number. So for example, log of 1.02, that is 1 plus 0.02, is approximately 0.02, which you could verify, if you like, on a calculator. Similarly, log of 1.09 is approximately 0.09. And more to the point here, log of 1 plus r over 100 is approximately r over 100 itself. And this is the approximation we will use for the denominator in just a moment. But wait, another thinker has an objection. Suppose I don't know anything about Taylor series. Why should I believe in this weird approximation? It's a fair question. So here's a second, lower level explanation for why that approximation holds. If we graph the two functions that are supposedly approximately equal, we see that, yes, they are quite close together, especially for modest values of r, below 20 or so, which covers the sorts of growth rates that we can reasonably hope to see for our money. Thus, it's reasonable for us to approximate the complicated function with the logarithm, with this simple one, without the logarithm. Our second thinker, newly enlightened, is satisfied, and I hope you are too. At any rate, we'll now replace the bottom of our approximation for d with the much simpler expression r over 100. Dividing 0.69 by r over 100 is the same as multiplying it by 100 over r, and 100.69s is 69. So now we have that d is about 69 over r. But 69 is close to 70, so let's make that substitution too. And lo and behold, we have just deduced that d our doubling time is about 70 over r years. So we have explained why the rule of 70 works. Hooray! Oh, and of course, 70 is close to 72, which explains the rule of 72. And that's that. So go forth and prosper. Invest some money. Open a brokerage account. And learn more mathematics. If you want to understand those logarithms better, read my book, Precalculus Made Difficult. If you want to understand Taylor series, read my book, Full Frontal Calculus, an infinitesimal approach. But whatever you do, plan for your future while you still have plenty of doubling periods ahead of you. Good night!